Tonight is the second of three nights reserved to hear from the community about the superintendent's recommended fiscal year 2024 capital budget and amendments to the FY23 through 28 capital improvements plan. We will hear both in person as well as video and audio testimonies. And tonight's hearing will be broadcast live on television and MCPS media. The board will hold an additional hearing on November the 14th to hear public comments on the superintendent's CIP recommendations. We will conduct another CIP work session during the board business meeting tomorrow, November the 10th. If board members offer alternatives during that work session, the board will hold a hearing on November the 15th. The board is scheduled to take final action on these matters at its meeting on November 17th. As always, board members are looking forward to hearing and considering your testimony. The order of speakers is listed on the agenda that is available on the board's website. Any written testimonies presented for tonight's hearing can be found on board docs. At this time, I'm gonna ask my fellow board members to introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Daca. Good evening, thanks for coming out. Dr. Joftis. Good evening. Ms. Harris. Good evening, everyone. Ms. Silvestri. Good evening. Ms. Evans. Good evening, I love seeing all of our students. Mr. Kim. Good evening, everyone. And Ms. Mondrowski is traveling and unable to join us this evening. Let's begin with our speakers who are here with us in person. When your name is called, please approach the podium and push the flat button below the microphone to turn it on and begin speaking. Please speak clearly and directly into the microphone. At this time, I'm going to call Mayor Newton. Good evening, President Wolf, Dr. McKnight, members of the board. I'm Rockville Mayor Bridget Donald Newton, and we thank you for the opportunity to share Rockville's testimony. The mayor and council also thank you for making infrastructure improvements to schools serving Rockville students, including HVAC and roof replacements, while still managing the ongoing CIP challenges related to the pandemic. Please know that on behalf of the council, we welcome the opportunity to work together to help address the needs of our community. Rockville students are burdened with overcrowded and aging facilities. Each of the five clusters serving our students, Richard Montgomery, Wooten, Rockville, Walter Johnson, and Gaithersburg, submitted summer 2022 CIP requests, and we ask that you address them as soon as possible. We are very thankful to the BOE for approving a feasibility study for a major capital project at Twinbrook Elementary School. The mayor and council and our community have strongly advocated for the urgent need of this underserved community since I was elected in 2009. And we're heartened that Twinbrook is finally being prioritized. Please complete the study expeditiously so that funding for this major capital project can be included in the next CIP. It is a matter of equity and inclusion that the school be completely rebuilt as it was constructed in 1952, it's older than I am, and is not ADA compliant, lacks decent space for specialists to provide individualized support, and is critical to closing the achievement gap. The pavement surrounding the school is significantly damaged. The dull building entrances need decor and school messaging to bring the spaces alive and on par with other MCPS schools. The employee lounge is outdated, teachers sit on lawn chairs donated by the PTA, there are no vending machines, and this impacts our staff morale. These conditions are unacceptable and need immediate resolution, and I implore you to prioritize Twinbrook students, families, and teachers by building a modernized school that will enable them to reach their potential. Richard Montgomery High School's seat deficit is projected to spiral to 505 in the 27-28 school year. Therefore, we ask you to request that Crown High School's building completion date be restored to August 2026. Rockville strongly supports the recommendation for an FY24 appropriation for construction. Given the broad impact to clusters in the Mid-County region, we request that you begin the new cluster boundary study earlier in the process so that our, all school and community organizations have an understanding of the project and are prepared for potential changes to the surrounding high school boundaries, including adjustments in articulation for middle and elementary students. 
We are exceedingly concerned that the Wooten High School major capital project has a completion date of August 29. This project must be ex expedited immediately. The school community is dismayed that their project has been delayed by eight years, while others have jumped ahead. While there was an approved FY23 appropriation to address site-related issues, the community still has not received any project details other than it will not be a full rebuild. From an equity perspective, we support the school community's view that all high schools should be modernized to the same extent. This aging facility desperately needs to be renovated, but MCPS will not make repairs due to the major capital project. The building has, has significant leaks, causing more damage to the interior, structural issues, the concession stand in the stadium is sinking. Due to repeated delays, the ADA and safety issues related to unseparated drop-off and pickup areas in the front of the building and the unsafe and crowded student parking areas still have not been addressed. Rockville frequently hears from residents who cite pedestrian safety concerns. And please provide a timeline for how MCPS will quickly address these critical building and site safety deficiencies. Rockville supports the build out of the second floor shell of the Carl Sandburg Learning Center and we urge that this funding be included in the board's CIP request. Please engage with us so that we can partner with you on a Maryville Elementary School and Carl Sandburg Learning Center project. The Mayor and Council also endorse the reopening of the Woodward High School in August 26 and the approved planning funds for a new Bethesda, Chevy Chase and Walter Johnston Cluster, sorry, Johnson Cluster Elementary School and the opening of the new Harriet Tubman Elementary School and approval for a feasibility study for a major capital project at Gaithersburg Middle School. And in support of health and safety in all of our cluster schools, please ensure that all interior classroom locking mechanisms are installed and the water bottle filling station project is completed. We strongly support the superintendent's recommendation to provide 2.5 million to begin the design for the relocation of the materials management facility. The city continues to be concerned for the safety of on-site MCPS employees due to the deteriorated state of the buildings. And a solution is needed for the glaring inequity of this blighted property in our historic African-American Lincoln Park community. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Next. Next is Margarita Williams. Hello to the members of the Board of Education, it's a pleasure. My name is Margarita Williams and I'm a senior at Thomas S. Wooten High School. I've been a student of Montgomery County Public Schools for over 10 years. I've done many things while being a part of a student in this school system, including taking dozens of classes, playing sports, and doing extracurriculars. However, one thing has always stayed constant for me, and that is music. I started playing musical instruments in the fourth grade, and when I was handed a euphonium on my first day of middle school, I knew that it was going to stick. This instrument became my entire life, and soon enough, I arrived at my first day of high school marching band camp. <laughs> the next four years came and left in a blur, and looking back on the end of my music career, the people and memories I have gotten the pleasure to experience at Wooten will stick with me forever. However, I wouldn't have had access to any of these wonderful opportunities had I not had access to multiple working instruments. I didn't even know what a euphonium was until it was placed in my hands in the sixth grade, and I'm fully convinced that my experience with instrumental music would have ended at that point had I not had the opportunity to have access to a brand new instrument. Unfortunately, dozens of students around Montgomery County are currently in the position that I would have been in, with no instruments for them to learn and become passionate about. Music has been psychologically proven to train both sides of your brain, and when I'm truly at my worst, music is always the thing that I turn to. Students in Montgomery County deserve the opportunity to, to learn about music from a young age, and the only way they can do that is through experience. Music creates such a wonderfully unique environment as it allows each of its students to shine in their own ways. Through my marching band experience, I have learned one of the most important lessons of my life. Everyone deserves a place to shine, and everyone has something to offer to their community. Unlike sports, music values everyone at the same level, and it creates a special type of collaborative environment that I have not felt anywhere else. Music is truly the gift that keeps on giving, and I hope that every student is as lucky as I am in the future to have access to the resources that they need to experience music excellence. Wooten's music program relies largely on external contributions, and in order for us to be able to perform and compete at the highest level, both students and teachers deserve more support from Montgomery County. The only way for music to prosper is through funding for new instruments and technology. 
Through funding, we rise as a program and inspire young, in young musicians to play their first instrument. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Carly Katz. Good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. I'm Carly Katz, a senior at Wooten High School involved in the SGA and Best Buddies Club. I advocate for Wooten renovations every year of high school, but somehow the renovation date gets pushed back every time I return. When deciding which topic to address, I struggle between picking the illegal lack of ADA compliance in our building, the toxic substances that run rampant throughout the school, hallways with buckets collecting water for months at a time, or the bathrooms that lack viable toilets, mirrors, and sinks. Throughout the last four years, I've had the excellent opportunity to befriend students at Wooten in the autism and SCB programs. And I've learned so much about my brilliant friends who persevere through unimaginable challenges. As if this marginalized community did not have enough to deal with, they must constantly factor in hazardous building conditions that put their lives at risk. As the fire alarm rings, handicapped students panic. They do not have a navigable path to exit the building. Because of the poor construction of Wooten, students must lengthen their time in a burning building to find a feasible exit, and even then must travel through uneven surfaces that are close to the perimeter of the building. In the case of an actual emergency, the building's construction will more than likely lead to the injury or death of these children. This is just one example of issues that handicapped students must think about in our school, but the list goes on. As the board, you have the opportunity to prevent countless fatalities and avoid lawsuits. So why don't you? The Americans with Disabilities Act has been a law since 1990, more than 30 years ago. Yet Wooten, students still, yet Wooten still has 380 identified issues with ADA compliance, making it a top candidate for immediate renovation. If allowing students with disabilities to have the right to a safe and public education, which they have no choice but to pursue, fails to qualify as a necessary building change, then I ask you, what does? By ignoring these problems, the disabled student population in Montgomery County receives the message that their needs as people and students do not matter to those tasked with their education and welfare. On top of non-compliance issues, students are forced to focus in a building filled with toxic substances. It is undeniable that the mold and asbestos in Wooten are prevalent. I have spent countless dollars and hours at Allard just trying to figure out why I sneeze every 30 seconds when I enter my first period classroom of the day. With every appointment, the results are the same. Mold. A few years ago, my family moved into a home with the same toxic substances that were, subject, that were subject to symptoms such as headaches, shortness of breath, wheezing, and nosebleeds. Luckily, we were able to move into a safer home that did not shorten the length of our lives. Yet I'm still victim to these detriments every single day. Frankly, as a senior in high school, these issues should not be my top priority. However, I cannot stand quiet and allow these students who are required to attend this school to be exposed to life-threatening but preventable circumstances. No student should have to fear, their for fear for their safety and well-being while at school. Don't wait until a student dies to take action. Wooten students are some of the top performers in the country, even with all the obstacles standing directly in their path. Imagine their potential when these obstacles are removed. If I care about the current students, faculty, and generations to come, why can't you? Thank you. Thank you. Next is Rhea Chalar. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Rhea Chalar, and I am a junior at Thomas S. Wooten High School. I have been a part of Wooten Student Government Association for the past two years, and this year I have the opportunity to serve as our SGA secretary. Throughout my three years as a Wooten student, the diminishing physical state of Wooten has been impossible to ignore. And when students call on the Wooten SGA to improve the infrastructure, we are left powerless. As one of the only schools built in 1970 that hasn't been recognized for renovation, the students of Wooten High School have been left behind by MCPS's capital improvement budget project. Whether it's the Wooten locker rooms, which have not been touched since the creation of the building, decaying bathrooms, non-temperature controlled classrooms, or dangerous hallways, students have to walk around the school every day, alarmed by the amount of mold, broken tile, random holes in the ceiling and walls, and toxic cancer-causing asbestos lining the ceilings. 
Wooten's bathrooms are known for a lack of mirrors and a plethora of appliances that regularly break. As a student athlete, the bathrooms by our locker rooms are sometimes the only option I can use while getting ready for practice, but with dirt covering the walls and floor, broken toilets and vermin, myself and many other students have been deprived of the essential need of having functional restrooms. Even in classrooms, mold is found on the wall, which has mycotoxins that can cause an inability to focus and is undoubtedly detrimental to the human body. This renovation is now not just a want, but a need, as it is putting students' health at risk. The lack of renovation has not only left Wooten's infrastructure on the verge of breaking down, it has also caused the building to be non-compliant with numerous ADA policies, which puts our students at a severe disadvantage. The walkways are uneven, the entrances and exits are incompatible with wheelchairs, and the stairs are steep, with only few options for those who cannot use them. In emergency situations, students are left with only few options to get to safety. Is this really the image of equality we strive for as a county? I am thankful that when I tore my ACL and meniscus in my knee during quarantine, I did not have to suffer in school on crutches for months and be deprived of the necessary accommodations which would risk further injury, as many of my injured peers have complained about. ADA laws are in place for a reason, so it is your responsibility to make sure they are followed. Members of the board and Dr. McKnight, I urge you to acknowledge these issues that put Wooten students at risk and allocate funding for the renovation of Wooten High School so that we as students can progress through our high school careers knowing we are safe and can study in adequate conditions, which is much more than we can say now. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Yana Coley. Good evening, my name is Yana Coley. I am a sophomore who attends Wooten High School. I stand here today to advocate for the renovation of our school for numerous reasons. I walk into school every day and never fail to see something that needs to be fixed. Whether it's the cracked tiles, or rather missing tiles on the ceilings, the constant leaks, bathrooms with only running hot or cold water, but not both, or the lack of toilet paper. The issues are never ending. Most importantly, although we may have an amazing special needs program, our school is still not ADA compliant. It is heartbreaking to see that one of the many schools in Montgomery County cannot seem to follow a basic law, a law that was put into place to, pr provide, to protect and provide safety for students with disabilities. The purpose of the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990 is to prohibit discrimination based on people with disabilities. This act not only allows for fundamental student rights, but rather creates an environment that ensures students with special needs are given the same resources I have as a student. However, I stand in front of you now 32 years later and no changes have been made to accommodate this law and the many students with disabilities. On top of this, wound itself hasn't even been touched in 50 years. Being a member of the Student Government Association, I have seen many people, including my own sister, who attended Wooten High School and is now a sophomore in college, testify. Yet there has been no progress made. Wooten has 380 filed ADA non-compliant fixtures, 215 being priority one items. These include the basic necessities, such as our stair steps, handrails, an exterior accessible route, and building entrances, and even parking. It is disturbing to see how our school is being dismissed by you year after year, but yet I see high schools, for example, Seneca Valley, Quince Orchard, Walt, Whit Walt Whitman, Richard Montgomery, that are renovated and that are met to a proper standard that is needed for students to succeed. Yet my own school is, again, being delayed the opportunity to be renovated by another two years. How would you feel walking into a school whose bathrooms have no toilet paper, or rather walking into the hallways and seeing a leak from the ceiling and a bucket catching all of the water. How about walking into school that doesn't even have accessible entrances and exits for you? Wooten students deal with this every day, but walk past all of it like it's totally normal because we don't know any difference. MCPS is in need of a is in desperate need of additional funding. The additional funding can be geared to helping schools fix all the non-ADA compliant items and go towards renovating our infrastructure to make a more pleasurable and safe environment for all students. A federal law is being broken. It is in your hands to implement it. I ask you to take in consideration all the reasons above and give your attention and time to make Wooten a priority. Thank you for your time. Next is Savannah Rabin.
Hello, my name is Savannah Rabin. I'm a current senior at Wooten. I've been at Wooten for four years now, so I know the school like the back of my hand. I'm looking to pursue fashion design and art, so I've been taking fashion design since freshman year. While Wooten has nice art supplies, the facilities have become a worry time and time again. Many of you may not know this, but the fashion class is held in the old woodworking studio. I've never seen the woodworking class in action, as it is no longer offered at Wooten, but I know by the way the room was built that it was not designed to be a functioning fashion class. The tables are built with an extra piece to hold materials so one can saw, yet all of the tables are broken. Extra wood pieces have been left behind from the industrial sized machines that were used to make projects. These machines are still in the room and are still able to be turned on. My wonderful fashion teacher, Miss Pierce, advises us not to touch them, but that doesn't take away from the fact that these dangerous machines are still there during the day and no one has any knowledge on how to use them. I'm simply trying to study something I'm passionate about and it would be great to have a place to learn. There are no other rooms that the fashion class can be moved to as they're all being used by other classes. Secondly, this classroom and others are held in the basement of the school. The basement is hard to navigate as you have to use certain stairwells to get to the different sides of the basement. It took me a long time to learn this and it is still challenging. One of my senior friends had to call me the other day because she was lost in the basement even though she had been at Wooden for four years. She was on the other side of the basement, had to go back up the stairwell and around the school and back down the other stairwell on the other side of the school just to get to fashion class that was in the basement. Because of this, she was very late. The basement itself is a dreary place. There are pieces missing from the ceiling where I can see the insulation and pipes. There are times that insulation or water falls from the ceiling. Sometimes I have to cover my nose and walk through as the sewer smell often wafts through the basement. Not to mention one of the most used rooms during the day is in the basement, the cafeteria. Hundreds of kids try to squeeze in the tiny cafeteria room, knowing that if they can't get a lunch table, then they will have to sit on the floor in the hallways. I have to do this. It's quite disgusting to have to sit on floors that people walk on every day to eat lunch. Yet most people I know have had to do that since freshman year. Wooten is a great academic school, yet the facilities don't reflect this. The school is in poor condition and should be renovated now. As a parent, I would not want to send my kid to a facility like this, nor would I want to work there. I strongly believe, as well as many others, that learning should be done in a safe and modernized facility. I feel as though the county has given up on us. I won't get to experience the changes of the school, but I hope the younger students in our cluster will get to someday. I ask that you consider all the testimonies today and realize that the renovation of Luden should not have to wait another six years. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Emma Yuan. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Emma Yuan and I will be testifying about Thomas S. Wooten High School's infrastructure. Wooten is ranked the 167th high school in the nation as of 2022. There are currently roughly 1,943 students at the school. As a sophomore at Wooten High School, I can proudly say that my peers and teachers at this school are supportive and help me become a better student. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same about the building that holds all of these students. The physical learning environment is important because on average, Maryland high schoolers spend 4,745 hours in high school, excluding extracurricular events and athletic activities in the school building, truly making school a second home. Collapsed ceiling tiles, broken toilets, leaky and unreliable sinks, unsanitary locker rooms, and unhygienic weight rooms. These are just a few problems students face in the Wooten building. The truth is that our infrastructure is no longer just an issue of our school aesthetics, but also a serious health concern. Personally, I have noticed the heating and air conditioning system is outdated and inefficient. I first noticed how unreliable the internal temperature of the building was when last year there were two or three days when it got so hot in my computer science class as well as the one next door that we would have to leave the classroom and complete our work on the ground in the hallway. For me and many of my peers, this caused a distraction, averting our minds from the material and altogether disrupting our learning that week. Being in the school for the first time as a freshman, this is not at all what I was expecting, nor what I hoped for. High school is one of the most important foundations for future success and the building of lasting relationships. And therefore, if students are not offered a comfortable learning environment, how are they expected to grow? So I ask you, how can I develop, learn, and grow when I'm constantly reminded of all the problems of my school building? 
As a student, I shouldn't have to worry about the unsanitary bathroom conditions on any given day or the old appliances within Wooten that don't work the same way they used to back when the school was built in 1970. Although I will be graduating high school in two years, I sincerely hope that Wooten can receive internal and external building improvements. I will forever be a Wooten Patriot, and I deeply wish that future classes feel proud about the history, the community, their relationships, and hopefully the school building itself. I want future incoming students to someday see the Wooten building for the first time and feel excited that they get to learn there for four years. Today, I urge you to allocate funding in the Capital Improvement Project budget to renovate and improve Wooten High School. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Yulima Fufana. Good evening, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. My name is Yulima Fofana, and I am a senior and SGA member attending Thomas S. Wooten High School. Throughout my three years of attending the school, I have never felt like I was learning in a sanitary and safe environment. One day, when I wanted to use one of the many dysfunctional bathrooms in Wooten, I noticed that the door would quickly swing open due to its loose hinges. That door was so unhinged that the noise of the door frightened the classroom across the hall. All I could think of at that moment was if that 100 pound door would collapse on me or anyone else who would enter. As I ventured past the unhinged door, I stumbled upon a line in the bathroom. I asked the person in front of me, why is no one using the other stall? To which she replied, it's broken. I waited for my turn to use a singular functional toilet and began contemplating if I should still wait, knowing I was taking time away from my classwork. 10 minutes later, it was my turn to use the bathroom. As I came out to wash my hands, I heard a blaring noise from the faucet, along with a vigorous rattling. Additionally, I tried to wash my hands, but there was no hot water or soap. As disgusted and aggravated as I was, I was not able to, sorry, I was, while the faucet was running, I wondered why, the new, why my new Nirvana shirt was, wet, was wet. I turned the faucet back on and noticed the broken sink sprayed droplets of water out of it. I was annoyed and frustrated. All I could think of was how wet and disgusting my new shirt was and how I was going to have homework now that I've been waiting in this long bathroom line. Now let's put this in pers into perspective. These events occurred during my freshman year. Nevertheless, I still find myself opening the loose squeaky door just to stand in line, wait for the one usable toilet, and yes, use the same broken faucet. I stand before you today to speak on how overlooked my community has been. Your mission statement has an emphasis on equity, yet you insist on skipping my school's renovation year after year, to the current date being sometime in 2029. These events are not acceptable nor equitable. However, I ask myself, why is it equitable for schools such as Seneca Valley, Wheaton, BCC, and many more like them to have had the privilege of, extend, of having been extent, expanded and remodeled? I acknowledge that your intention is to remodel Seneca Valley was to develop a comfortable, naturally lit, and energy efficient environment, yet I often wonder why those intentions are not applied to the Wheaton community year after year. How is it equitable for schools such as Seneca Valley, Wheaton, and BCC to have had these amenities, but for my school to keep suffering from the perpetual leaks, the snake falling out of the ceiling, the AC being on when it's 35 degrees outside, the gapping hole in the ceiling, the lack of aeration in the bathrooms, the massive holes that we have to cover to keep plastering shut so the rats can stay out, and lastly, from the many things on this list, our mental well-being being jeopardized due to my peers constantly questioning if their safety is endangered. How are we supposed to feel, face, feel safe in a school that is so hazardous? The only impartial way to rectify the situation is to begin a C CIP budget for Wooten to be remodeled. All my peers and I truly desire is to fulfill your mission statement of providing a safe environment for our kids to learn. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is William Godnick. Good afternoon, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is William Godnick, and I'm a senior at Wooten High School. Today, I'm here to voice the concerns of the often neglected students with special needs. The American with Disabilities Act is over 30 years old, and the majority of Montgomery County public schools still aren't ADA compliant. How are we supposed to believe that MCPS is inclusive of all students when our school buildings aren't infrastructurally safe for everyone and indirectly marginalize those who can't navigate through them as easily? The lack of ADA compliance is awfully inconsiderate of the diversity of MCPS's student body. Personally, I have a sister who was a special education student at MCPS. She was initially assigned to Wooten as her school, but the lack of appropriate physical infrastructure was a substantial obstacle to her educational well-being and progress. So she had to move to another school with a more conducive environment. 
At Wooten, there is only one emergency exit from the school for the area that hosts the Wooten Special Education Program. This exit empties out onto a narrow relatively narrow strip of sidewalk above a steep hill of grass. This is an extremely precarious setup in cases of emergencies for special needs students with physical challenges. One fall or misstep in a moment of panic could injure many people. There are also portable classrooms nearby that empty out into the same area. This would be overwhelming for the average student, not to mention our special needs classmates, their teachers, and aides. We cannot overlook the rights to the safety of all of our student body. As we have continued to advocate for this issue, MCPS officials have promised change. However, we continue to see none. The lack of ADA compliance throughout MCPS buildings discriminates against a group that already faces enough challenges. The lack of ADA compliance throughout MCPS fails to provide a free, appropriate public education for students with disabilities. The lack of ADA, ADA compliance throughout MCPS denies students with disabilities their basic rights. Above and beyond that, the lack of action and help throughout these years implies that our special needs students are not your priority. I know that the members of the MCPS Board of Education were elected because they care about the well-being of students. We believe that you care, but we ask that you show us that you care. In closing, I'm not here just to represent the positions of the wound community as a whole, but also to highlight the voices of those involved in our special education program, who might not always be able to express their feelings of insecurity as directly as I'm relaying to you right now. Thank you for your time. Thank you. At this time, we'll have uh, questions from my fellow board members. I will start out by saying that I want to thank you all for coming. You all are great. You come every year. And many of these issues we do know exist. But um, Mr. Adams, I have a, a couple of questions. They've raised a few issues that are sort of more immediate things that can be addressed fairly quickly, such as water leaking, toilet paper, I mean, I, I, I know that, um, I believe it was, I believe it was Carly had a, a, a list. You just went down the list. I'd have to go back to the, um, to the video. But I wanted to know uh, if we could get somebody over there to take a look at these things because water shouldn't be leaking, tiles shouldn't be falling, and toilet paper should be available. The faucet that was mentioned that sprayed one of the young ladies, the, the toilets that aren't working, something needs to, somebody needs to get over there and take a look at that stuff as soon as possible. Absolutely. I do understand the, the ADA concerns. I don't know if you want to speak any to that. So, yes, I, this, is, this is reoccurring testimony that we've, we've, we've heard and obviously we've prioritized from the capital improvements program, the site-related aspects of the ADA. Um, we've, we actually had an opportunity to meet with the city of Rockville, with, with uh, many of their code officials, as well as their fire marshal, to really walk through the building, understand it, develop plans in conjunction with the administration to make sure the building is safe. Yes, we, we have published the ADA um, findings on the website, many of which are referenced, and, and we obviously are looking at it from, uh, from accelerating aspects of the project where we can, uh, particularly from the exterior of the building. Um, but, but yes, we'll, we'll continue to, to look for ways. I mean, there, there are operational improvements um, that we have identified, and, and that's the follow-up that I have, is to go out to the school to make sure that we are uh, actually uh, implementing some of those operational improvements. Um, but uh, duly noted, and it is something that I would say um, from a board perspective, um, the board has recommended, started this project with a completion date of 2026. Um, it was delayed by, uh, by the council by one year, that first CIP, and then the last CIP, um, the council delayed it uh, an additional two years. So, so I would say there has been an effort from the board for advocacy for this particular project uh, because there, there obviously is importance to, to, to focus on several of the uh, items identified by students today. Well, thank you for reminding us of that. Also, has there been any mold remediation or checking for asbestos over there? So that's one area that I will follow up. I just pulled the work orders, and, and it is um, we've received over 200 work orders since August um, with the completion of 150. You know, Some of those were related to plumbing concerns or HVAC challenges, but I, I certainly will ask the IEQ team to go out and do a thorough investigation to make sure we have a current baseline of, of any of the indoor air quality conditions. Thank you. Um, I'm going to start with 
Anybody have their light on? Have any questions? I guess we've heard Ms. Harris. Yeah, uh, just a quick follow-up. So thanks to the students for speaking. Um, and I remember um, when, uh, Mr. Adams, when the, uh, there were a group of Wooten students that testified last year, and there was a mention that uh, you or somebody from your team would, would go to Wooten and actually meet with the students and walk the facilities and with them look at some of the issues that they're raising so you could kind of brainstorm together. Did that, did that happen? So, yes, I think Wooten, I've been to Wooten more than any of our other facilities to work with the administration and, and variety of other stakeholders, including, including some students. I, I believe some of the students that we met with previously have, have since graduated, but certainly we can go out uh, again and, and meet with current students and, and continue our, our exploration of, of improvements. I, do, I would say with, uh, as mentioned by Mayor Newton, the, uh, the appropriation uh, that was approved for this project, which is $15 million for site-related improvements, there, there are a, a variety of things that we are going to look at, particularly as it relates to, to the egress uh, pedestrian and, and traffic safety elements of, of the site. So if we're able to do um, you know, significant work ahead of time, that's certainly not going to replace um, any of the, the, the building elements that we talked about, which will come as part of the, the major capital project, but that will be a great improvement for, for a lot of the, again, the pedestrian, vehicular, and, and some of the accessibility and, and uh, uh, access, egress aspects of the, of, of the site. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, it, I mean, it could be useful to, you know, have some of the team, you know, go and do a day in the life walk with the students so they can see what the students are experiencing in real time and some of the issues that they're, that they're describing. Because, I mean, as Ms. Wolf um, indicated, some of these seem like quick, easy fixes. I mean, if something's leaking, um, if, if simple building services should be able to keep soap and toilet paper and things in the in the restrooms that's not a capital issue but um, you know as well and yeah I guess the the main uh, you know main safety issue would be um, if there is exposure to uh, mold and asbestos getting that you know inspected and dealt with immediately but also the and I remember this from last year too when students testified about the concerns about the nearest emergency exit for some of their special uh, special education classrooms and I, I, I don't know if that if, if the students and your team kind of did that walk to figure out if there is a, a some kind of a short term fix, but um, you know certainly we want to make sure that it's possible for students to get out of the building safely um, in, in an emergency. No, absolutely, and that is one of the areas that we walked with the the local code officials. Um, you know, we we worked with the you know the special ed staff, but but particularly the administration to really walk the building, understand what the, the emergency exit elements were, uh, make recommendations, make changes. Um, there were aspects to even the, the bus loading, unloading, uh, particularly around our special education students that we made recommendations to, to shift um, times because they, they were loading in an area that what I would say is definitely not an accessible area or a conducive area for, for the function that it was serving. So, um, you know, we will go out again. I, I think there's there's aspects that we also identified as possible uh, improvements, as you know, relocating classrooms, um, relocating you know different programmatic functions to to make egress a little bit smoother of a transition, particularly in some of those emergency cases. So, um, yes, we'll, we will return, and and I know it's a it's a newer administration. So, um, you know, over the years we've we've worked with previous administration. We'll we'll go out and and again, revisit and walk through some of these operational elements and, and explore what we can do from a capital standpoint as well. Yeah, and I think it would be great because I'm sure some of these students here would, would volunteer to be like part of a small task group that would do that walk with you all and, you know, bring the students' perspective to it and then they could also share um, with their peers um, some of the work that's ongoing. And, um, and, and correct me, are... The students mentioned the number of ADA compliance issues, and I know we we that stuff is th those findings are on the website. Are, is the, are the web pages on those issues up to date? So, so what we have published it was that point in time uh, assessment evaluation of the consultants. We obviously have done some level of improvements. Some of the larger elements, you know, if, if it identified um, you know aspects of of where to park and and the accessibility from the parking to the building. We have looked to see if we can relocate and, and modify. There was elements that were identified, such as things like low-hanging tree, tree limbs. I mean, it really looks at it from a holistic 
um, accessibility barrier standpoint. And that's what it is, truly is. It looks at it from a barrier standpoint. So, uh, you know, we have made some improvements, so it's not what I would say is the most current, but that was the point in time evaluation and publication uh, for that assessment process. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, and, you know, we've got a bunch of student energy here to can help show you what's going on and also uh, be a conduit for information back and forth between their, 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 their fellow students. Yeah, I just want to follow up on Ms. Harris's comment because we have heard you. In fact, uh, myself, Dr. Daka, and before Ms. O'Neill, we actually came to Wooten and walked the path. And so we do understand the concern, particularly in the back of the school, I believe it was, and the terrain that you're dealing with. So don't think that you're being ignored because we have come out ourselves to look. And we will come out again and take a look at what's going on, particularly after some of the work has been done. And, and Mr. Adams will be in touch with, with your people. Ms. Silvestri? Yeah, um, I, Mr. Adams, I wanted to know if you have um, some ideas for how do we keep the Wooten community abreast of the progress that you're making? Because you are working on things, and I don't know if that's communicated to the Wooten community so that people don't think that nothing's been done. There is some progress, and how does that get communicated uh, to the school population? And my second question is, I recall that we passed a resolution to get uh, ADA updates, um, and just wanted to know the status of that, addressing ADA uh, concerns in schools. So for the first question, I, I do think, um, you know, we, in the coming months, we will begin the design process for the, for the, for the site improvements. I think that'll be a great opportunity for, you know, that constant dialogue, the creation of, of living, breathing documents of, of what we are, 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 are developing, what, what, you know, short-term, long-term goals that we are working through. So I do think that will be a great opportunity to have that, that, that sort of early, often conversation piece um, related to capital improvements. And in terms of the, the ADA report, I'll have to go back and look. I knew that, I know that is a, a point in time report that comes to the board. And I'll just have to, to, to revisit exactly when that comes to the board. But if there's, a, if there's an interim update that we can provide, I'll certainly uh, provide that shortly. Okay, I'm not seeing any other lights at this time. So next I'll call Vanilla Sh Shimsu. Now turn it back on with the red light. Press the button. There you go. Good evening, Dr. McKnight, members of the Board of Education and fellow students. My name is Anila Shemsu, and I'm a junior at Wooten High School and the class of 2024 vice president as well as a special elections committee deputy for Montgomery County Regional SGA. A crucial aspect for a safe and beneficial learning environment is undoubtedly school infrastructure. Students feel encouraged to learn in a building where they feel secure for their needs. Unfortunately, Wooten High School is not that school. As you walk through the building, you're greeted by an unhealthy atmosphere. Missing ceilings, tiles, holes in the walls, bathrooms without toilet paper, out of use toilets, and ceilings that are a musty brown color from decay has been the norm for us. Tra trash bins under leaky walls when it rains is not a sight unseen by many. Additionally, the building is filled with bugs ranging from cockroaches to spiders, snakes, and even bugs that I can't even name. Even mice and rats crawl through the building we have to eat our own lunches in. For so long, our school was not ADA compliant, nor is it still, with only one wheelchair access point in the special education classrooms which are in dull condition with no direct access to sunlight. Now, Wooten still has one wheelchair access point, but no improvements in other such area. While this may seem like a joke to many, our school's horrendous infrastructure became the focus of an Instagram page dedicated to pointing out the flaws in our school. Wooten High School, built in 1970, is well over 50 years old. Minimal renovations have taken place since the doors first opened. In 2016, the school was planned to be completely renovated. However, due to the Montgomery County Capital Improvements Program, the school's plans for a complete renovation were never completed. 
However, it is important to note that other schools have had major renovation projects, some of which were in better condition than Wooten. Seneca Valley, a high school built four years after Wooten and has a significantly lower student population, underwent a complete renovation. In the 2019 to 2020 school year, Wooten High School had a population of 2,134 students, while Seneca Valley only had 1,226 students. Walt Whitman is another school Another example of a school that underwent a major expansion before Wooten could even get working faucets. And now another large project, Crown High School, is being built before Wooten's urgent needs are addressed, which I may point out goes against the capital improvements program, which was made in the first place to address the urgent needs of these schools. It is a disgrace to the Wooten community, respectively, that we've had to put up with this while the county has provided other schools in better conditions with a total or partial renovation. At this point, our community has pleaded more than any other. It is my hope that the county take the time to provide us with something as simple as a building that is safe for us to spend eight hours a day in. Thank you. Thank you. Next is the Vivek Majumda. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Vivek Majumdar, and I'm a senior and SGA president of Wooten High School. I'm here today to talk about an issue that has plagued the students and staff of Wooten for the past two decades. I think that it's safe for me to assume that the majority of the members of the board here today believe in the fundamental right for a child to receive a free, public, and safe education. However, certain circumstances within my very own high school, Wooten, fall well below such standards. The issue for us is not one of simply having a better looking or aesthetically pleasing building, but of having a building that is safe and equitable for all who attend it. A conversation with any Wooten student about our building will reveal the following. Bathrooms in which dirty colored liquid drips from the ceiling, blatant mold growing from the vents in some of our lower level classrooms, and an auditorium with seats so worn they can no longer be sat on. Renovation for a more modern school, however, is half our battle. Per the Department of Justice's guidelines regarding the Americans with Disabilities Act, a civil rights law passed nearly three decades ago, people with disabilities should be able to, quote, arrive on the site, approach the building or facility and its amenities, and enter as freely as everyone else. In 2018, EMG project architects and engineers were contracted to perform accessibility evaluations to Wooten and nearly every school in MCPS. The results from Wooten's assessment were shocking. Non-existent passenger loading zones and accessible parking, a consistent lack of ramps, those existing not wide enough to accommodate the average wheelchair, and emergency exits designed without the special needs person in mind. Members of the board, I ask you to take a look around the room. The parents, students, and staff that you see around you here today are not here for themselves. Every wound student in this room will be long gone before any of the changes we ask for will ever be implemented. They are here for the student that cannot attend a football game with their peers because their stadium is not accessible to them. They are here for the student that can't take part in certain school activities simply because they can't access the part of the school in which the activities are taking place. They are here for the thousands of future students who will one day call themselves Wooten Patriots. To answer your question, Ms. Harris, from a student's perspective on whether or not anyone came to our school, uh, walked with students, and um, uh, addressed our concerns, the answer is no. As uh, someone who's, uh, who's been a part of SGA, the Wooten Student Government Association, for the past three years, I can wholeheartedly tell you that that did not happen. Um, for myself and many of the people here today, that's just another example of a promise that was made and a promise that was not kept. The bottom line that I hope to leave you all with today is, how are students supposed to feel included in a school building that is not built to include them? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Madeline Matthew. 
Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. My name is Madeline Matthew, and I'm a sophomore at Thomas S. Wooten High School and part of our SGA. Today, I'm here before you to speak about Wooten's failing infrastructure and more specifically, the bathrooms. Thomas Wooten High School is ranked second in Maryland high schools and 167th in the nation. With these high rankings, many would think students would be provided with a nice and professional building, but that's not the case. Wooten has mold-filled walls, a dysfunctional temperature systems, missing ceiling, ceiling tiles, but the worst of all are the bathrooms. Last Last year, my family and I moved from North Carolina to the Wooten area. My father insisted on me coming here due to its academic rankings and standards. Last year, as an incoming freshman, I imagined Wooten would be grand and pristine, yet I was met with disappointment. I refused to use the bathrooms of how, because of how unhygienic and disgusting they are. Each Wooten bathroom has a putrid smell when you first walk in. The surrounding grout on the bottom of the walls is covered in mold and dead bugs. Not only is it unappealing to look at, but it's dangerous to one's health. As you know, exposure to mold can lead to symptoms such as stuffy nose, weak using red or itchy eyes. Long-term effects of exposure to mold toxins in children create memory problems and dizziness. These long-term effects greatly affect students' learning problems as a whole. And so I asked, should students have to choose between using the restroom or inhaling mold and other toxins? Another problem with the bathrooms are the lack of necessities such as toilet paper, paper towels, soap, and feminine products. There have been many times where I've gone to the bathroom and there's no toilet paper in the stall, causing me to ask the person next to me to hand me some, which is traumatizing and embarrassing. We have paper towel dispensers empty, meaning we must return to classroom with dripping, dripping wet hands. Moreover, the feminine dispensers are provided for student use but are never filled. I know the struggle of your period coming randomly during the school day. When the dispensers aren't filled, it creates challenges for many girls who are not carrying feminine hygiene products. It can result in accidents during school and missed class time in order to fix this situation. Why have a solution for the problem but never implement it? Furthermore, the soap dispensers are empty, which is extremely unsanitary. Students need to use soap and water in order to kill the bacteria from your hands. Lack of soap for hand washing can lead to illnesses and bacteria being spread throughout the school. The fact that wound students can't get these basic necessities is unbelievable. Another problem with the Another problem with the bathrooms is that the toilets are old, which cause them to leak and clog, clog easily. This is a risk to the health and safety of students. If a person or object touches or gets sprayed with the toilet water, they could get infected with E. coli. A toilet leak on the floor causes mold to grow on the floor and under the toilet. This hints to why all the bathrooms carry a smell and why the tiles in the evening while the tiles in the many of the bathrooms are uneven. Many students wait till they get home to use the bathrooms because of how awful the conditions of the bathroom are. Why do students have to put up with these problems? Members of the board and Dr. McKnight, I urge you to renovate our school. The students at Wooten shouldn't have to suffer because of the board's lack of funding for Wooten infrastructure problems. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Kelly Wren. Good evening, Montgomery County Board of Education, parents, teachers, and peers. My name is Kelly Wren, and I am a junior at Thomas S. Wooten High School. I have been class president for the past three years, and I'm here to represent our class of 2024. I'll start off by saying that I know Wooten High School inside and out. I started high school at Wooten three years ago, but I have been coming to this school every week for an extracurricular activity since 2010. I have been intimately familiar with Wooten since I was five years old, so I know firsthand the conditions of the building. Parts of our school have not been touched since it was first built in 1970. That's older than my mom. <laughs> the same holes in the ceilings, the same broken toilets, the same plumbing issues. The lights constantly flicker, the air conditioning doesn't work well, making it unbearable on hot days, and dead mice were found in some classrooms. The locker rooms in the basement have mold growing along the walls with showers that nobody wants to touch. Additionally, the building was designed in the 60s, and rules and regulations concerning access for people with disabilities have changed, so now our building is not ADA compliant. Just an example, one of my good friends suffered a traumatic football injury last year where he dislocated his hip and broke his pelvis, so he had to sit in a wheelchair throughout recovery. He missed a quarter of the school year because he felt as though, quote, Wooten's facility would make it too difficult to maneuver around in a wheelchair. This opened my eyes to how badly Wooten needs renovation. Another example, although there are elevators for students who need it, just last week, seven students were stuck in an elevator for more than an hour. Um, 
All, it's one thing to not have all the latest technology and modern facilities, but when safety is affected, this becomes a concern for our school. Back in 2016, plans were made to do renovations on Wooten. However, those plans have been constantly getting pushed back. As of right now, the renovations have been pushed out until 2029. How many more decades without renovations can our school handle? We are in desperate need of a remodel, but it seems as though we are not heard. Former students from Wooten have testified for the necessities of these renovations in years past, and still nothing has been done. Will it take a tragedy or a lawsuit to set the wheels in motion? I'm so passionate about this because I love our Wooten community. Safety is the most important factor, and we want to take good care of our students and teachers. On behalf of Wooten, thank you for listening. Thank you. Next is Alexander Johnson. Please play the audio. My name is Alex Johnson. I'm, I'm sorry. What did I'm you say, I'm an 11th grader at Wheaton can High you, School. Can you have... I, I didn't understand what you said. My name is Alex Johnson, and I'm an 11th grader at Wheaton High School. I'm a student athlete at the school, and I play varsity baseball, football, and wrestling. I'm speaking and writing today on behalf of the baseball team. Currently, Wheaton High School is the only high school in the county, MCPS, uh, that does not have a batting cage. The batting cage was in the original blueprints that were drawn up for our school's reconstruction to be funded and built by MCPS. But for some unknown reason, the plans for the batting cage were removed with no explanation provided. As a student, I see this as unfair and a serious inequity. My teammates and I have the right to the same facilities and opportunities as every other school with an MCPS system. Not having a batting cage makes my school an outlier, makes us feel inferior, but also puts us at a disadvantage compared to other baseball teams when competing. Please do the right thing and take the legally appropriate action by building a batting cage for my school. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Noreen Quadir. Okay. Good evening, everyone. My name is Noreen Kather, and I'm the Cold Spring PTA president. I'm a proud graduate from Paint Branch High School. I want to thank you for, for requesting a feasibility study for Cold Spring Elementary. We're waiting to hear for more details. At the same time, I want to remind the board that our school needs to be renovated to resolve safety concerns, which cannot be fixed through the routine maintenance. I also want to offer Cold Springs community support for the renovation for my children's future high school, Wooten. This is my third year testifying for Cold Spring Elementary to request for a new building for Cold Spring. It needs a complete teardown or a rebuild for the safety of our students and staff. The current structure poses several safety issues in severe weather or in an active shooter situation. The school is also highly distractible. Cold Spring is one of the only open schools in the county, a school with no walls. I say no walls, but teachers and staff have to create walls to divide large spaces between classes. Sadly, these makeshift walls are unable to contain the noise, so it's hard for students to concentrate. Cold Spring tends to be very loud. All of our hallways are noisy, conversations carry through our classrooms, and learning is hard, regardless of where you are in the building. Our bathroom hand dryers constantly go on and off, but they can be heard in classrooms, which is another huge distraction. Cold Spring does not have any safe hallways. During severe weather drill, our students are shuffled into far corners of the building and bathrooms. Most classrooms do not have closets, so students have to quickly move, and in some cases, out of their classrooms to closets and other areas, other community areas. Students are literally piled up on top of each other in these small spaces. The current building does not provide a safe environment for our students in an active shooter situation. The Cold Spring has no real walls. There is no physical barrier that prevents an individual from entering into a classroom. Students and staff have limited spaces to hide, as mentioned above, and they have to travel to these safe areas. This leaves students in intimate danger. I will never forget the phone call from our school principal at 4 o'clock on May 24, 2002. This moment is forever etched in my, in my memory. It's the day of the U Uvalde shooting. She called me in tears and asked if I had heard the news, and I told her I was just reading the article on CNN and I would call her back. 
A minute later, I called her back. Her and I cried, and we had shared our stories over the last few minutes of just how emotional it was for us. She expressed how upset she was for the students, the parents, in that community. We both exchanged comments that it looked like our school in the background. This realization is heartbreaking. Ten minutes later, I was dropping off my child at soccer practice at Cold Spring, and I knew she was there. I went and rang the school bell. It was after hours. We both hugged each other, and we talked about the subject of concern. It was very emotional. In that moment, I recommitted myself to this cause. We need a new school. Lastly, I would like to offer support for a new building and renovation for Wooten High School. On October 15th, just a few weeks ago, I was there representing the Cold Spring community at the fall festival held in the parking lot and grounds surrounding the football stadium. Standing, with my, standing at my kids' future high school and walking around, I was disgusted by the state of our building, the stadium, and bathrooms. As I mentioned, I'm a graduate from Payne Branch High School, so I graduated quite a while ago, and I watched many of our schools being built and the condition of their schools. Many of my friends have kids that are at Wooten. I have babysitters from Wooten, and I see kids from, from Wooten. I ask, how is Wooten? Their first comment to me is, it's gross, which you've heard in today's testimony. So today, you've heard from the students. I think the only thing left to say is, what else do we need to do to get a new school? It is unfair that our children go to Cabin John, which is renovated. Half of Cabin John students go to Wooten, which is in desperate need of renovation. And half of those students go to Churchill, which is also renovated. Why don't our children get the same treatment as their friends and classmates in neighborhoods? And one last point today I would like to bring is that the CIP process is broken. As a parent, I should not be here pleading with you for a new building. There should be a recap process or a schedule where buildings are regularly maintained. In closing, I asked for a new school for Cold Spring Elementary. I also asked for a new school for Wooten High School. I invite you to come to Cold Spring. We welcome you with open arms and we'll be happy to walk you around. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. At this time, I'll take any questions or comments from my fellow board members. If you have anything, please turn your light on. Ms. Harris. Um, uh, yeah, Miss, just a, one qu first question back to Wooten. Um, it does, we, we're hearing a lot about simple building services issues here. Just no soap, no paper towels, no toilet paper. Um, I, I know that's not, I mean, writ large, the building services staff is managed at the school. But is there anything that we can do to reach out and see why that seems to be a persistent problem? Yes, that is something that I've identified for, for follow-up. Um, we do centrally monitor the, uh, the distribution of supplies. And, and, and so I am confident that there's not been a shortage of, of supplies that have been delivered when, when obviously when requested or, or proactive. So um, we'll follow up with the team and, and just understand um, the process in which uh, facilities are, are, are addressed and, and how we, we restock supplies throughout the day. And, and the other question I have is uh, the testimony from the, um, Mr. Johnson, the athlete at Wheaton. Is that true that Wheaton um, is the only high school without a batting cage? I, I can't say for sure if it's the only school without a batting cage. What I do know is, is the batting cage was part of the design. Um, the shot put and discus was, was requested for relocation during the, the build process. And that relocation is in the place of where the batting cage was intended to go. So we have been working with the school to try to identify an alternative location. Um, if if uh, worst case, we, we have to go back and relocate um, the, the the discus and, and javelin um, pit back to where it was originally intended, and then we can we can put the batting cage where, where it was designed. But yes, they do not have a batting cage at the moment. Okay, yeah, I I, I don't know if it's the only high school or not, but I, you know, it's otherwise a really nice field. I could when I taught at Edison, I could look right out my window and watch them install the whole thing. So, um, okay, thank you, Miss Evans. Sure. So Miss Harris and I, we were 
channel channeling each other. Um, you stated a lot of what I was going to state. And I was going to say, I am so proud of you all just coming out here and advocating on behalf of your school. So the one ask that I was going to have for you, just do me a favor. Um, attend, and I don't know if you don't, maybe you do, go to your PTSA meetings, right, and have these conversations with your um, school administration. But it is great to come here and tell us because we want to know, we need to know, we definitely support you all. We want to make sure that you have the best learning environment. But some of the issues that you have been talking about happen right in your school, could be taken care. And we don't want you to feel like you have to wait until our meetings. We host meetings. Um, our hearings are in November and in January, and that is just too long. But I do appreciate you all taking out time, coming to share the many issues that are going on with Wooten. Um, all of the peers, all of your peers prior to you have come out as well. And so it is a priority for us, and we did hear you. And then Ms. Harris also mentioned um, the student from Wheaton High School. The student from Wheaton High School, and Mr. Adams addressed that. So that was my other thing. But it is so great to see you all. I love it. Keep up the great work. And I did want to say, um, you all always have great ideas. There's a student sitting in front of me. You didn't testify. I didn't see your, I don't know your name, but he has a, a um, He's holding up a flyer saying, uh, use ESSER funds. So <laughs> I appreciate you trying to let us know how we can do that. <laughs> Our ESSER funds have been allocated, but absolutely, we're going to try to make sure that we can take care of that without having to use ESSER funds. All right. Thank you. Dr. McKnight. Thank you. Nika knows about those ESSER funds because he's a part of the budget advisory as a student. So very good. Good to see you putting that, that knowledge to work here. Um, I wanted to thank the students for coming forward and, and sharing what your day-to-day -day experiences are. I am um, directing the staff that as we follow up with Wooten High School, let's go ahead and request a meeting with the principal building services team, um, along with the SGA uh, leaders in the building so that they can be a part of the discussion to understand exactly what it is that we can address immediately um, and then what is going to take a little bit more time in terms of long term. The reason I'm asking that our SGA leaders be a part of that discussion is that I know that um, not all the students who wanted to share this concern could be here tonight, but I am asking our SGA leaders, um, based on your participation in this meeting, for you to go back and share the outcome with all of the other students that are here that are not in SGA and those who were not able to attend this evening. So um, we will follow up and, and commit to doing that. Thank you. I too want to thank all of the students that came here tonight. This is absolutely incredible. I also encourage you to go to a county council meeting and share your concerns with them also. Uh, at this time, I'm not seeing any other lights, so I will call Laura Stewart. Do I see Laura? Okay, I don't see her. We'll come back to her. Narissa Johnson. Good evening, Dr. McKnight and members of the board. Um, my name is Narissa Johnson, and I am the president of the PTSA at Wheaton High School and also the cluster coordinator for the Wheaton area. So my testimony today will touch on four issues. But before I do that, I want to reach out to the Wooten community and say, I see you, I feel you. I do hope your building gets renovated soon because as somebody who's allergic to mold, I know what it's like. It is a very, very unhealthy situation and it sounds like a very dangerous situation. And when your building does get renovated, call me because I have many post-construction les uh, lessons that I'd like to pass on to you that hopefully you will not have to experience. So, following on on that, my four issues are as Wheaton and our community, we have four different problems. One is lack of usable space for students at Wheaton High School. Number two, post-construction quality problems facing Wheaton High School. Number three, lack of a batting cage, which was mentioned by Alex Johnson. And number four, general quality and school layout problems at Sergeant Shriver Elementary School and also Wheaton High School. Problem one, lack of usable space. So the current student enrollment at Wheaton is approximately 2,600 students. 
our maximum enrollment capacity was supposed to be 2,340. So we, are, we were not supposed to hit that number until 2030, according to last year's capital improvement plan. So every building in the Every room in the building is now fully utilized. Students are taking classes in non-instructional spaces, and student athletes, especially female athletes, have limited access to locker space for their personal items because there just isn't enough space for the lockers in the first place. Um, please note that Wheaton can function at current enrollment and will always continue to accept students regardless because our school is committed to our students, but understand that they will face challenges along the way because enrollment numbers are going up and will continue to go up for a while. And so we will certainly need support to address this challenge. Problem number two, post-construction quality problems. So our building was opened in 2016, so it's less than 10 years old. And currently, we have problems with our plumbing infrastructure. So we routinely get leaks and flooding in classrooms and hallways, and students regularly have to be moved because of that. And the number of available bathrooms, which are usable, substantially reduces, which means you have students who don't want to go to the bathroom, which is a health issue because this may lead to UTIs and other issues, self-esteem issues, and also, um, you know, overcrowding at whatever is available. Um, the school regularly loses power. Um, so once again, this interrupts student instruction. Number th uh, poor electrical wiring work around the school, especially the concession stand. It's unusable for its original purpose because when the fryer and cooking devices are used at the same time, circuit trips, and that's it. So we have resorted to you cooking in the main building and bringing the food out, and or just using portable devices, which is not the purpose of the concession stand in the first place. It is not a very efficient use of our facilities. Um, problem number three, back paddling of what we feel is an agreement by MCPS to provide a batting cage. Um, I have been told by administrators at school that we are the only high school in the county that does not have a permanent one, and this is an inequity that needs to be addressed. And um, this is also a potential Title IX violation because our girls' softball team uses the batting cage, and currently they are unable to do so. Fourth problem, general quality and school layout problems for Wheaton High School and Sergeant Shriver Elementary. At Shriver, Uneven outdoor surfaces constantly result in standing water issues on the school property every time it rains. This is a safety hazard for st staff and students. The children regularly slip on the floor because the shoes are wet, and when the water freezes, they risk falling on the ice. Courtyards, meanwhile, have six inches of standing water on a regular basis. Now we have a remnants of a hurricane coming through on Friday, so this ought to be very interesting to see what happens at the school, and I invite members of the board to just pop by for a visit. I'm sure they'd appreciate it. Um, solutions. Oh, sorry. Final problem at Wheaton High School. We seem to lack the, the school admins seem to lack the authority to turn project classrooms into regular classrooms when the school needs it. Why is that so? And then also, um, we have privacy issues for male, female and male student athletes who are not, who their locker rooms are located in a very oddly shaped U-shaped corridor, dead space and all. And so staff members cannot so have a clear line of sight to the students when they're changing. So this is a serious safety and also privacy issue. Um, on behalf of the schools, I would like to thank you for listening to what I had to say today. And um, is that my time is up? Yeah. yeah. And um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. I can. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next is Adam Lee. Uh, President Wolf and the board, uh, Dr. Malnak, and all the MCPS uh, leads and staff, good evening. On behalf of the 10 school in the player cluster, well, we want to thank the Board of Education member and the superintendent for constructing a capital budget that keeps critical plan project on our schedule. So for the player high, uh, for safety, we request to uh, uh, have a review about the classroom door to be replaced so that each teacher in the room can see through the window to the hallway. Because right now, most uh, classroom uh, windows on the door is like one foot, one foot higher than the teachers or the, even the high school students can see. For the East Silver Spring in the main school, to improve the safety, 
we request appropriate markings and the signage uh, for the crosswalks on to improve the traffic flow and pedestrian uh, safety of pacing on the uh, Styles Avenue. Uh, on the asset, we request to upgrade lightings in the hallway, classroom, bathroom, offices, and multi-purpose room. For Montgomery now in the school, we to improve the health. Uh, we request to have the hand dryer right, uh, to be installed on those bathrooms. For New Hampshire and uh, Estate and Emergency School, for health, we request the installation of new ventilation infrastructure to pull the air out, right, out of the uh, bottom level of the school to address the long um, standing issue about the mold. For the old view and the management school, we did appreciate the recent installation about the security camera. Thank you very much for that. And uh, the utility and the field upgrade are all appreciated. But to improve the safety, we also request appropriate marking and signage on the cross off and especially the parking area right, to improve the traffic flow and pedestrian safety. For health at the old view, we request the, to examine the roof, right, the roofing for the repairment and the, the replacement, uh, possibly the replacement on the roof to address the leakage right, across the building. There are also three assets about the three items about the assets. We request the replacement about the flooring throughout the building, with the exception the recent installation about the media room and the room 110. We appreciate that installation. Second item and under SS, we request the upgrade of the lighting about the hallway, classroom building, and offices, and the all-purpose room. The third, we request the new student lockers on the uh, hallways to free up the classroom space. So in closing, on behalf of the Mangari Bria Cluster, we thank you again uh, for consideration of all our recommendations. We are very excited the appropriations for the planning funds that has been reserved on the budget on the Eastern Middle School and the Piney Bridge and the Middle School. And then moreover, we appreciate the construction at the uh, Norwood and Woodward right, um, to alleviate the crowd overcrowding issue right, to release not only for the player, but also the surrounding cluster. My name is Adam Lee. I have a 12th grader at the Mangani Blair, so probably you won't see me next year. <laughs> and, Lima, and on behalf of the other class of coordinator, Lima Abdora, uh, who's the mother of the third grader at the ESS and the sixth grader at Hakuman Park. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Charles Swain. Good evening, BOE staff and um, the larger MCPS community. I'm testifying on behalf of the uh, Meadow Hall Elementary School, and it's in the Rockville cluster. Um, I'd like to echo some of the mayor's comments from earlier about the specifics of what we have going on, but um, I wanted to start with some thank yous and some considerations for the planned re-roofing and HVAC replacement at Meadow Hall. Let's rewind back to November of 2020. Uh, Metal Hall Elementary School's PTA presented at this meeting. And, um, and uh, we're here today to follow up on behalf of Metal Hall regarding their request for a building addition as it relates to the roof, re-roofing, and the HVAC replacement. <clears throat> at that meeting, we had a great discussion about the school utilization. And um, again, that was in November of 2020. And it included a commitment to relook the, uh, the how the school is being used, the enrollment, the school, the building capacity, and um, we appreciate that as of last year, you guys have heard our concerns. You've relooked at the how the school is being used, the autism program, and our status as a uh, focus school, and how that relates to the, the classroom utilization, and um, we really appreciate that. Uh, in addition to your continued advocacy for, or our advocacy for a building remodel uh, that would help with this, this uh, overcrowding, we would also like to bring up delayed maintenance issues with our HVAC, which uh, we're hoping to stay on track for 2023 as it is right now. We were slated to have that replaced in H uh, 2022, 
but the replacement was delayed. Uh, it sounds kind of like a lot of things going on um, across the district. Um, but we'd like to get your assurance that this is going to stay on task. I appreciate your advocacy so far, and if you guys could really push for that, it'd be awesome. Our schools in serious need of replacement units for this HVAC and updated thermostats. The school and building temperatures are inconsistent, with some rooms requiring staff and students to wear bundled, uh, be bundled up in the middle of summer, or the rooms are stifling hot where you can't even focus on the, the learning that's going on. Um, and earlier this fall, we had some rooms with a putrid odor coming out of the HVAC unit. I appreciate MCPS really stepping up and coming out quickly to fix that. But that, that points to some of the issues that we have with this, the school already being crowded. If we have an issue in one of the rooms, we can't maneuver around and get learning back on track. Uh, we currently have one third of our students in portables, some dating from 2004, so they're showing their age. And in addition to the 120 plus students in the portables, we're using every square inch of the old building that we have from the 50s uh, uh, to its, its capacity and then some. Uh, we have one room that's supporting ESO, ESOL staff, uh, special ed, parent community coordinators, reading specialists, and more just in this one room. And it is, it's very difficult, even though the staff are doing their very best, it's very, very difficult for them to actually be able to focus and get their jobs done. Uh, we routinely use storage space for small group meetings and uh, mop closets and the like. And I, I don't think this is sustainable. So um, we, we have this opportunity with the new HVAC and re-roofing to look at how we can extend that out or um, what, what kind of benefits we can get while this, this small process is, or recapitalization is going on. Uh, there, there's four benefits I'd like to talk about really quick. There is increased safety and efficiency in ingrading these portables either back into the old facility that we have or somehow getting them to be a cohesive part of the school structure. There is the efficiency in a modern HVAC, a central one, and a new roof that should be spread across the campus, so not just the main building, but somehow integrate those portables. And we would like you to consider maximizing the cost savings by investing in flexibility now and hedge against inflation and the demands of future projects. Said another way, uh, make sure that the HVAC and roof projects enable meeting future design needs while minimizing the constraints on those future projects. Uh, might mean a little more spin now, but the benefits will come in later. And we like to return the focus on instruction without distraction from infrastructure issues. This is the most important consideration, and with all of these goals that I mentioned earlier, it fits back in with the uh, blueprint for Maryland's future and the strategic planning that's been going on. So I'd like to thank you for listening, taking action. I really appreciate that, and for your consideration on a request for Meadow Hall in this uh, coming year. We appreciate your time, energy, hard work, and dedication to improving our students. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Jim Bradley. Thank you, uh, President Wolf, Vice President Sylvester, Dr. McKnight, members of the board, thank you for the opportunity to testify tonight. My name is Jim Bradley, I represent the Walter Johnson Cluster. We're grateful for the board's support of the Woodward High School reopening and we look forward to working with you to complete the project. We're also very grateful that Mr. Adams and Ms. Carmias have been great partners on that project. Uh, even when we don't agree, they're incredibly responsive and we do agree most of the time. Um, I have attached written testimony with specific school requests, so I'm going to, uh, including some from WJ, to address the reality that until Woodward reopens, we will have more than 3,000 students in a school that's billed for about 2,400. WJ cluster coordinators who preceded me testified before this board more than a decade ago, urging the solution be found to the looming overcrowding crisis our high school would face. I first began to advocate for that solution as a member of the WJ Roundtable, the 2016 Roundtable, when my daughter was a second grader. Uh, I saw, as others did, that the WJ was facing a capacity crisis coming down at us. That crisis was exacerbated by the planning board operating in a silo, a council and executive that woefully underfunded the CIP and cut impact taxes, slashed the spending affordability guidelines when interest rates were at historic lows. Now, none of that is your fault but it's not our kids' fault either. 
My daughter's a ninth grader now, and even if the CIP amendment that Dr. McKnight put forward is approved, and we beg that it will be, uh, it will not help her. Woodward High School will open too late for her. But it won't be too late for the WJ and DCC families with younger kids who are dependent on Woodward to ease the overcrowding at our area schools. The board has voted to reopen Woodward to solve overcrowding at WJ and in the DCC. Thank you. Now it's time to finish the job. Construction costs have gone up due to national and international factors that are far beyond your control, but also due to state mandates and overlapping interests and delays. You know, just one example, contractors are on site for phase one. If delaying phase two means paying those contractors, whether they're building something or not. Uh, also, because the planning board demanded it, the, there's now a designed bike lane to be built along the edge of the Woodward property. Now, we, we love bike lanes. However, Maryland DOT is also building a bike lane along Old Georgetown Road. So now we have two bike lanes designed and planned, which are redundant and dangerous. So there needs to be some redesigning and planning to occur to integrate those two processes, which add costs that are not actually reflected yet in the amendment before you. Then there's also the hand wringing by the county executive over a tiny parcel of less than an acre of scrub of trees that has always been intended for school use or for public housing uh, and has yet to be returned. These uncoordinated mandates are piling on cost to MCPS projects. And we know that the cost of major capital projects like Woodward are a huge strain on the CIP, but they're also essential. Woodward is mentioned in the Rock Spring Master Plan, the Bethesda Master Plan, the Littonsville Sector Plan, all three White Flint Sector Plans, and the Grosvenor Strathmore Minor Master Plan Amendment as the capacity solution for high school overcrowding in Bethesda, Rockville, Silver Spring, Kensington, Wheaton, and everywhere in between. That's a lot to put on one, one high school, which has now been reduced in size due to the requirements of the, of the state mandates uh, for the blueprint from Maryland's future. So we urge the board to engage directly with your fellow political leaders at the county and state level to ensure that this project and all the projects that have been brought before you today are funded appropriately and expeditiously. If you do that, we will be right there with you. As I know Mr. Adams and Ms. Carameas know, we are particularly good at advocating and being a presence in Rockville and in Annapolis, and we're happy to keep doing that. So please ask what the county needs to do the job right. Ask for the funding necessary to reopen Woodward and keep the commitment made to our kids. Ask for the funding to do the Wooten renovation, which I mean, I've been listening to that testimony for more than an hour. It's desperately needed. These commitments have been made separately and together by the planning board, by the council, and by the board. Ask for the land that you need, whether that's at the, the parcel adjacent to Woodward or, plan, or land that's coming up in development plans that go before the council and the planning board. We'll do everything in our power to support those requests. We'll lobby the council, we'll lobby the planning board, we will push and prod and advocate, but we can only fight for what you ask for. So please give us the arguments and we'll go make them. Relatedly, we, we do urge you to keep on track the site selection process for the uh, elementary, BCC WJ elementary school. We know there isn't a need to build that school yet, but we also know that land is at a premium in our part of the county and we do know that you can lop two years off of the development process just by identifying a site today. We're stand ready to support you and we look forward to working with you. I also would be remiss if I didn't thank Dr. Joftis and Dr. Docker for their service to the board and to the community, especially Dr. Docker for your many, many years of service to us. Thank you, and thank you to all of you. Thank you. Next is Carrie Primozik. Okay. Thank you to the Board of Ed, President Wolf, Dr. McKnight, and MCPS for being here and listening to our Gaithersburg Cluster CIP testimony. We want to start by letting you know a little bit about our cluster PTAs. We are in the process of building back and maybe even reimagining PTA. Our PTA boards are working to communicate with parents by actively trying to find support for Spanish translation in meetings and correspondence. So we can continue to work at finding ways to reach and support our community. We have been in conversation about the need for diversity in our boards and membership, prioritizing our PTA boards to be representative of our community. We are not fully there yet, and we are learning ways to do things differently to truly engage our families. 
We have learned from the anti-racist audit equity of access section that references resources, facilities, and classes that there are reports from families, students, and staff of, quote, inconsistency in access to resources for students from racially and ethnically diverse background. As our cluster is majority black and brown, we want to know what is next and we want to be involved in the deliberate work to reach our students and families. We are excited about the new beautiful Harriet Tubman Elementary School. We would like to thank you for supporting this project as it has created a better learning environment for our kids. As the Crown High School project develops and the boundary study begins, we request that the Gatesburg Cluster and any other clusters who have been involved in this process are included, not just invited. We would like to make it a high priority that our Gatesburg Cluster is a part of the action and represented at these meetings. This may need to look different than past boundary study procedures as all clusters are different. We hope some recognition of cluster differences would be honored in this process. We have a real concern for Laytonsville Elementary School. They're in need of a ramp at one of their doors that is an exit to the outside of the building. This is the fourth year of CIP testimony that this ADA compliant issue has been shared and still no ramp. What happens if there is an emergency and a child in a wheelchair needs to get out of the building, yet the door that they are closest to does not have a ramp? What will the teacher or paraeducator do? It's been like this for a while. The school does have an SCB program with children in wheelchairs. We feel ADA compliant funding is a priority for all of our MCPS schools and are advocating for all schools to be able to have their buildings ADA compliant. The superintendent's amendment of $10 million to address the backlog of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning projects is a high priority. Gaithersburg Middle School has had HVAC issues for years. In fact, this is the sixth year this is being highlighted in the CIP testimony. It's been a while. Our GMS kids are cold and hot and need a proper functioning HVAC system to keep their great brains comfortable and ready to learn. We were quite surprised by the feasibility study for Gatesburg Middle School. It is great that the process to address the future of this school building will begin, as GMS has two special education programs, the ARS and Bridge program, and we have a Spanish and French immersion programs. Our student population has increased to 900 students, and our building built in 1960 is not able to sustain the special needs for our programs. We are asking to be included in the feasibility process. Our parents and caregivers need to be a part of the procedures. We need to be represented and a part of the decision making. Our cluster does not have the ability to simply fundraise to support our school in certain CIP type needs that many other schools may be able to do. It is great other clusters and schools have this ability to do this. We do not. We're not able to simply have fundraising event that will raise money that can be deposited into the independent activities fund and then be used for school building needs like stage equipment. At Gaithersburg High School, we need our students to have access to functioning stage and sound equipment. The projection system and the sound system in the auditorium are not working. This affects the student's ability to have the proper AV technology to hold concerts and drama productions. At Gaithersburg Middle School, the stage lighting and sound needs to be replaced and upgraded in the auditorium gymnasium. What is currently in place does not work. The so this supports all choral and band programs, school plays, general school events, and all of a new theater class. Is this okay? Our arts programs do count. Our students in these programs do count. Our GMS and GHS students need access to the proper equipment for this stage, courses, productions, and performances. Please see our written testimony for more. Most of all, we need our cluster to be considered, included, and invited to the table in these CIP issues. We are a quiet cluster. We do not want to be forgotten. We want access to safe, comfortable, and functioning buildings. We look Look forward to be in full engagement with MCPS facility staff in a very near future on these urgent CIP needs in our Gaithersburg cluster schools. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next is Sumet Sharma. Good evening, dear board members. My name is Sumit Sharma. I am here again to testify on behalf of the Wooden Cluster as its cluster coordinator. Just like the past, we would like to reiterate the capital improvement needs of our schools and urge the acceleration of the Wooden, Dufif, and Cluster and Cold Spring projects and request a commitment against further delay. 
we have patiently waited and respected the county's decisions in advancing other clusters projects while delaying or eliminating ours due to budget constraints. However, the time for attention to our cluster is now as we can no longer let the conditions in our schools worsen. Periodic temporary band-aids are not cost effective and are no longer a viable solution. We again start with Wooden High School, a 50-year-old building that is one of the oldest in the county without ever undergoing a major capital improvement. Although we appreciate the recommendation for a CIP, the budgeted funds are much lower and the size and scope of the complete uh, renovation are much lower than the scope of renovation it really needs. What is worse is that the timeline for the school's partial renovation continues to be pushed back each year, with completion now delayed until 2029. Meanwhile, the conditions at Wooten will only continue to deteriorate and the severity of the issues exacerbate. All, also, even though the county has previously approved uh, about $15 million for a limited site work at Wooten. Our community has not yet received any information about how and when those funds will be expended. As mentioned in the past, some of the issues, and tonight, as some of the issues include an outdated and poorly functioning HVAC, HVAC system, unsafe air ventilation, leaking roofs and pipes, antiquated wiring, science classrooms without safety equipment, and broken bathrooms which are so disgusting that students choose not to use. Most horrific is the faulty design of our congested and narrow driveway, which poses a daily severe safety risk. Separate from all of this, Wooden's ADA assessment has revealed extensive high priority accessibility issues, which must be resolved now well prior to the uh, 2029 completion date. Uh, we want to also dispel any concern by board members that parents may be opposed to a renovation because they do not want students to be in a holding school. We understand that no CIP plan for Wooten would entail a holding school, and therefore this is not a legitimate excuse for inaction. Given all of these dangerous and unhealthy conditions, it is critical that Wooten's CIP timeline be accelerated rather than suffer continuing delays. We now turn to Dufif Elementary, where a planned expansion project was already scheduled to commence and be completed by next year in order to address overutilization and serious capital needs. Leading up to that, several smaller critical maintenance projects were denied and temporary fixes were instead employed in anticipation of the larger approved project. However, as you know, around this time last year, without warning, Dufif was inexplicably pulled um, from the CIP list without any contingency plans, leaving the school in a much worse situation. Although we appreciate the recommendation for a feasibility study for Dufif, the upcoming process should be accelerated and streamlined because the MCPS and Dufif community has already investi invested significantly over the past decade in the same process. Doing otherwise would be inefficient and not be cost effective. Next, there are still lingering issues at Lakewood Elementary that remain unresolved. It, in, in particular, there are drainage problems in the back grassy area and a crumbling playground, which is more than 20 years old, that has been on a replacement wait list for several years. Waiting is simply no longer an option because the amenities' unsafe conditions rendered them useless. This finally brings us to Cold Spring Elementary. Uh, while we are encouraged by the recommended feasibility study, we want to emphasize that the scope be as broad as possible to address the school's unique characteristics, such as its open classroom concept without floor-to-ceiling walls and hallways and rooms which are not designed for students to navigate safely during severe weather or other emergencies such as an active shooter. Assessing Cold Springs needs solely through the lens of enrollment numbers does not paint a, paint a fair and accurate picture picture of its grave and urgent issues. In closing, years of advancing other projects at the expense of the Wooden Cluster has resulted in a, in a more unique set of aggravating circumstances and worsened conditions in our school. Simply deferring the Wooden Cluster projects cannot be a natural reaction to budget constraints. 
In closing again, Montgomery County does not advance its goals of equity by placing a lower weight on the Wooden Cluster's concerns. We are in fact Thank a you. very diverse community in many ways and our children's educational needs are as equally important as Thank others. You. Thank you. Thank you. We have your testimony. Next is Lauren Berkowitz. Please play the video. Hello, I'm Lauren Berkowitz, one of the Winston Churchill Cluster Coordinators. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I will be providing an update for the CIP for the Winston Churchill Cluster. The most requested need for schools in our cluster is improved security. While Churchill and Bells Mill have made specific requests for the CIP update, security upgrades are issues that impact many of the schools in our cluster and therefore merit further investigation. Potomac has also requested additional help with security cameras. In particular, Churchill requests continual upgrades that help with safety and security, such as permanent repairs or replacement of doors at the entrances, improved lighting around the building and grounds, and additional cameras. The Bells Mill administration has been actively reviewing security infrastructure procedures and procedures. They need additional fencing to secure the fields and limit entry points onto school property. They also need additional card readers to manage building access during recess. Another common request from schools is addressing the need of vulnerable students in the cluster. Churchill requests upgraded sidewalks and walkways to make them ADA accessible and bring them into compliance. In the long term, Churchill will need additional space and improvements to make complete use of the health and wellness supports. Bell's Mill also has concerns for the safety of students with disabilities. Bell's Mill is home to the Head Start program and two full-time autism classes. The playgrounds are not adequate for students in these programs and need significant improvement. Bell's Mill has raised this as a top priority. The current substrate creates issues for students with autism who might be more likely to engage in PICA. The mulch is also problematic for the youngest Head Start students who may still have accidents, etc. The school requests a rubberized substrate, which they believe will be more appropriate for both playgrounds and consistent with current standards on inclusive playgrounds. HVAC issues are a common issue in our cluster schools. At Churchill, there is a continuing need to address the outdated HVAC system so that it will maintain the appropriate filtration of air that protects against COVID spread and other disease spread while also regulating the correct temperature. I know we have testified on this issue for multiple CIPs. The HVAC is not on the state list, but has also not been repaired to full functionality. In addition, several elementary schools, particularly elementary schools built after a certain date in the county, do not have HVAC and gyms. I believe in our cluster, this is at least an issue of Bells Mill, Wayside, Potomac, and Seven Locks. And I need to check on the other elementary school in the cluster. It gets very hot in these gyms in late summer, early fall, and spring. Students and faculty overheat and should have temp a temperate environment to participate in athletics. Bell's Mill has space concerns due to its increased enrollment and had to repurpose spaces this year. For example, with the additional Addition of a fifth section of third grade, the school had to repurpose a classroom used by part-time specials teachers and pull-out services. Now, a storage room is used as an area for small group instruction. If enrollment continues to increase, the school will soon run out of additional options for instructional space. Given Bell's Mill smaller campus size, option for portable classrooms would be limited. Bell's Mill also requests a shade structure for their limited outdoor spaces. Shade structures provide additional educational opportunities and would be wonderful additions at other schools in the cluster and throughout the county. This has been raised as a concern at Bell's Mill by parents and others in the community, especially during COVID, the lack of shade structures. Bell's Mill requests a functioning electronic sign outside of the school. The current electronic sign has not functioned in years and attempts to fix it have failed. 
<coughs> the sign is important to provide information to the school community. While Bell's Mill received communication last year from the Division of Design and Construction that there might be some help to have this upgraded, they have not heard anything further since October 2021. Lastly, Herbert Hoover Middle School and Cabin John Middle School request new Promethean boards to replace those that have stopped functioning and light boxes are needed. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today for the Churchill Cluster. Okay, at this time we'll hear uh, questions or comments from my fellow board members. I would like to ask Mr. Adams one question. I believe um, Mr. Bradley referred to the redesign that might be needed as a result of the highway administration and the bike lanes. As I understand, you are looking at that. Can you talk a bit about that? So, so that is that is correct. Um, the uh, State Highway Administration did come out and, and make uh, create a project that would essentially take a lane away from old Georgetown Road and create a bicycle dedicated lane. Um, it is also correct that that would be in major conflict with our current design. So we're, we're actually working with them to figure out how to merge the two projects. Um, this does get back to some major county planning issues, right? The reason we have um, what we call the breezeway on our, on our school site is to conform with the county's master bicycle and pedestrian master plan. Um, so these two are at a bit odds. So we're, we're, you know, we're unfortunately going to be sort of the mediator in trying to, to resolve it. But our first and foremost goal is to make sure, um, you know, we create a safe environment at, at each of our, our school sites. Thank you for that. Also, Bell's Mills electronic sign. I thought we heard about that before. Is there any update on that? Any possibility? We are looking at um, many electronic sign requests that have come in. Uh, as, as with um, many of the other projects and construction projects, electronic signs have, have seen you know, extended lead times and costs. So we, we are trying to work with individual communities to prioritize and, and, and update current plans, but uh, you know, currently with our, with our competing agenda of, of issues, um, we are setting electronic signs as a bit of a back burner as we, as we address some of the other infrastructure items um, on our list. Yeah, there were several um, infrastructure issues that sounded like they could be handled rather quickly, so I'm sure that you heard them too. If, oh, Mr. Arvin. Uh, yeah, I, uh, HVAC concerns certainly seem like um, a common concern uh, from what we've heard today and, and just generally a concern that I think many community members carry. Uh, so I, I just wanted to ask about, you know, what's our, our process like for um, hearing about those and, and the steps we take to address them and seeing as it uh, is a concern that we hear often, um, why, why might that be and, and what changes can we perhaps make to that process to, to um, heed that? And, and that's a great question. And, and um, we, as a school district, as a board, have, have been prioritizing infrastructure improvements like HVAC. Unfortunately, um, HVAC as a countywide that is, is funded as a, um, a, a large program that's intended to solve many projects, it does see reductions and cuts through you know, the budget process. So, uh, in this board, you know, in, in the superintendent's um, recommendation, uh, she did restore the, the lost funds from the HVAC program. Um, but to answer your other question of how do we identify, you know, that is um, the, one of the top priorities from us, as you've heard, many of the issues do relate from HVAC. Uh, so, so we look at it from twofold. Um, one being complete replacements of, of projects. You know, we heard Meadow Hall. That's that's been one that we've been working with the state to to receive funding. Um, you'll start to see in our operating budget, and we talked about it before, uh, enhancements to our preventative maintenance program so that we we can maintain and, and continue to keep in, in great operating conditions the ones that we do replace. So, so it is a process which which we go through and we evaluate. You know, pretty much annually. Um, for a prioritization standpoint. Um, the one challenge I would say is these projects have seen probably the highest um, inflationary impacts of all of our projects. 
Um, you know, we used to see projects like uh, um, the Meadow Hall project, you know, re replaced at a cost of about $1.52 million. Uh, the request in this CIP as part of state funding is $5.2 million. Um, so you can see just how that, that cost has gone up over the past, you know, five years. Um, so it is, it is one that is a, is a top priority. I think it's one that we continue to come back to the board and say this is something that, you know, we, we really need to focus on as a school district and, and prioritize. Um, but, uh, but yes, we, we, we're trying to address it from a variety of different, different uh, angles here. Ms. Evans. Yes, um, so thank you all for coming out and taking time out of your busy schedules to create your testimony. Um, I remember at one point I've done that as well, so it can, it can be a lot. So I, we do appreciate you all coming out and sharing with us. Um, we heard from a student about the batting cage, and so I just wanted to recognize Ms. Johnson for mentioning that, and you said you were going to look into that. Could we, um, I can't remember everything that Ms. Johnson said, but there was one thing that stood out for me. It's talking about we're supposed to have um, remnants of a storm come through on Friday and we'll wait to see what the water flow will look like. She said it, it, it could freeze over. Like if there, I forget exactly what you said. And Mr. Abbs, I don't know if you heard, but is there a way that we could look into what she's talking about so that we don't wait to see what the problem will be, that we try to do something um, preventative? Um, was it Sergeant Shriver? Yes. yes, yes, yes. Yes, we, we will you know, review that. Um, from a Wheaton High School standpoint, I I, um, I don't necessarily agree with some of the construction-related concerns. There are a variety of, of elements that we've been working with the staff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I do think as as a district, we we are going to spend more time, um, you know, working with our students and, and staff around restroom-related you know mm. impacts. You know, we we've seen an in increase in clogs across the district, ah. and and so I think we've talked about it before through yes. a variety of, of, um, of initiatives that we need to continue to go out and educate around the impacts of our infrastructure. Um, but from a, from a stormwater perspective, you know, we are still working to close out the stormwater. If, okay. if you all recall, the, uh, the last piece of that project was the softball field, which is owned by the parks. Um, that has been by far the longest duration project we've ever participated in, but we are so close to being finished and okay. finishing that project out. So, but we'll, we'll follow up and make sure that uh, there, there are no water impacts or stormwater impacts um, related to any storms or- Yes, I appreciate that. I just want everyone to know that all the board members, we take copious notes in addition to our superintendent and all of our staff. And so while we ask these questions of staff, I already know they've written them down and they're taking notes, but just wanted to um, make sure that you all knew that, that we're all taking notes as to what you're saying um, to be able to come back and address what we can really quickly. So thank you. Ms. Harris. Um, yeah, just a couple questions, and I, I did have a question, Mr. Adams. So uh, we did hear about two schools where they uh, mentioned external standing water, and Shriver was one. They said uh, external standing water in, in, in a courtyard as well, but also uh, the mention was Lakewood. And when we're looking at external standing water issues, are those are those always things that we can remediate on our own, or do we need to pull in parks or? So, so I am aware at the Shriver, um, the the, uh, the administration did just recently reach out about standing water in the bus loop. So we we are sending our civil engineers to look out to see if if regrading can solve it or if, or if existing uh, new drainage can help the situation. Um, Lakewood has has been a an issue for several years. Um, uh, that's one where we've we 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 are going to take the mayor up on on her uh, you know offer to work with city staff to solve that the uh, that's been a project that's been a challenge just based on some of the regulatory elements that have been posed on us uh, to just make that basic fix so uh, hopefully that's one that we can resolve some of the uh, some of the, the the major cost challenges and 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 fix the the standing water and the playground issue that was that was raised but but uh, yes, we, we are looking at, at any of these issues. They are in progress, and, and we'll continue to provide those updates to school administration for, for distribution to you know, staff and families. Um, thank you. And just, um, I think you may have answered this, but Mr. Swain's um, uh, request about the, the timeline for the roof and HVAC work at, at Meadow Hall 
um, and then the potential for the addition is the are the and you mentioned some looking into some state funding for that is do we have a timeline for that project so, so from the uh, roofing and HVAC perspective yes we we have requested that that matching fund from the state um, you know one of the challenges with with Meadow Hall is is the current lead time of that equipment so we're we're it's currently at 42 weeks which is unprecedented um, so we're working with contractors to look at different different ways to get that project done as soon as possible. Um, you know, once we, we we receive some feedback from the contracting community, I, I believe it's this week or next, we're, we're going to go out and, and work with the school and just make sure they understand what are the, the, the current challenges and what we're looking at to, to mitigate. But yes, that's a high priority for us and, and one that uh, was, we were hopeful to do complete last year. Um, you know, but due to funding constraints, it, it was shifted to this year, and now we're just we're battling some of the uh, uh, the long uh, manufacturing durations and supply chain issues. But 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 as we presented the other day, we're looking at a variety of different ways to to, to, to figure out how to overcome that. Yeah. Um, and I appreciate, as Ms. Evans said, you take all these copious notes and and, and all the the issues that are raised. Uh, I did want to follow up quickly on the Bell's Mill issue the playground services being not the most appropriate for students with the special needs there. Is that something that's on our radar? Uh, yes, we're, we're actually looking at a variety of different schools, particularly from, from the, the special education perspective. Um, we were fortunate enough to work with Senator Zucker for, for a playground grant, so we're, we're exploring and piloting different um, soft surfaces. Uh, you know, one of the challenges we've had with soft surfaces is that um, they, they are sometimes um, uh, advocated against, right, you know, to, to minimize the, you know, the installation of, of rubberized type of surfaces on, on our site. So we, we, we believe we found a product that is environmentally friendly and one that will solve many of our, our special ed and ADA challenges at our playground. So uh, hopefully this summer we'll start to see um, some progress on that, particularly from the Innovative Playground Initiative as well as the the, the partnership with, with our state delegation, um, but we will happily provide an update based on you know, some of our pilot findings in the near future. Yeah. Thank you, and I did, I did just want to elevate uh, Mr. Bradley's comment about you know, sooner rather than later for us to start identifying that site um, for the elementary school in that area. Um, I know that's been a, something that's been simmering for a while, but and, and through the support of the uh, of, of, of the cluster, um, we have worked with the developers of the WMA, WMLA site that, while that's not been identified as, as the set site, um, we have, you know, sort of jump, got a jump before working with developers. They've installed infrastructure for us in advance. So I, I, I do think, you know, we've had a great partnership with that community and, and partnerships with, with the development community as well as the planning community. So. Uh, yes, when we come back for that site selection, hopefully we'll be well positioned for whatever site we ultimately land on for, for the future school. Thank you. Before I move on, I want to thank Gaithersburg Cluster for bringing some of our youngest students to advocate. We're always excited to see them. Next up is Chanita Sinkler. Good evening. My name is Shanita Sinkler. I'm a Christian, a wife, and most important, a mother of three. An RM graduate, a Wooten freshman, and a defeat fifth grader. I stand here to ask you to fund three action items. First, a security vestibule at Dufif. On May 24th, 2022, 19 children and two adults were gunned down in Uvalde, Texas. Parents kissed their nine and 10 year olds goodbye and never saw them again. Today we ask, how did this happen? Partly because people in positions of authority did not act. You have the power to act right now to help prevent a Uvalde tragedy in my child's school by installing a security vestibule. Security vestibules are a key safety tool. Every school should have one, especially one like Defeef, which has more special needs students than any traditional school in Montgomery County at 32%. Those special needs students will need extra help in any emergency. If something happens and you fail to act, 
thoughts and prayers will not bring me as a parent any comfort. Second, we need basic maintenance funded. We keep to being told our school is being rebuilt, and so basic maintenance is being denied. Every child deserves a safe, clean place to learn. We need our walls painted, interior and exterior. Our principal spent time during the summer painting walls. We need dead trees removed. We need our HVAC system fixed. These are things that you could do now to make school better for these students. Finally, you've heard a lot about Wooten High School, but I want to talk to you about the Wooten weight room. There's been, it's in terrible, atrocious condition. There's a lot of focus in this county on mental health. And one way that students can stay mentally well is sports and exercise. When you talk to students about the weight room, and I have a child who's an athlete, the equipment is unstable, it's rickety, it's cramped, it has poor ventilation, they have limited ability to prepare for their sporting contest. It may not seem that important to us as adults, but it's important for our children. So we're asking you to fund this renovation now or at least approve the Wooten community's ability to raise funds so that we can have a decent place for our kids to work out. But we need your approval to even move forward to just raise money. You know, when you get, you're voted in, we trust you to do everything in your power to keep our kids safe in an equitable manner. So I'm asking you, fund the defeat security vestibule. Pay for basic maintenance at the school. Fund the Wooten weight room or let us raise money to get the weight room fixed. One day, the king will say to all of us, including you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. What will you be able to say to that? Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next is Melissa McKenna. Good evening. It's been a while since I've been in this room. My name is Melissa McKenna. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. And we all exhale. We're all here together. I have been in this room more than 10 years now, and I've advocated for every school that came up before mine and after mine, because it's all of our children. And if I'm not here for other people's children, why would I ever be here for my own? I have three key things tonight. First. Please, please schedule a few days in between the CIP presentation and the first work session. I know it's traditionally the last Monday, and that happened to be Halloween instead of the 24th, but that's a lot of information for our communities, and I'm sure the board to digest and learn and prepare advocacy. It would at least show that MCPS is serious about making sure the community has access to information and can more fully participate. It's a small step to rebuild trust. Second, MCBS needs to build and renovate net zero energy schools. Enough. With the cost of so many construction related components increasing exponentially, we must build smarter and more efficiently than ever before. Take the extra time now with the construction funding delays to add renewable energy to Crown High School and Woodward High School from the very beginning. Net zero school construction is now a well-established process at a cost comparable with traditional construction. Many of you saw Discovery Elementary in Arlington, Virginia. There's also Hollow Bird Elementary and Graceland Park in Baltimore. And at the time they were built, it was comparable to what MCPS was building per square foot. Not only will a net zero energy school generate its own energy and heat, thereby saving millions of dollars. The bonus, there's an extra bonus the school facilities themselves become the learning tools. And there's more, but wait, there's more. The cream on top of a win-win situation is taking advantage of the five percentage point increase in state share of funding for schools that are built as net zero buildings. I've been on this one for a few years. Seth and Adrian have heard this before. We have to do things differently. I was grateful for uh, Mayor Newton to come out again from the city of Rockville. In the past, the city has graciously provided an investment in every new school built in the city. My hope is that they may still be able to do some project with Maryvale Elementary and Carl Sandburg Learning Center. Maryvale is just 15 minutes students away, 15 students away from needing that shell. My one specific request is to please restore the funding to build out that shell from the FY21-26 CIP. 
it would give you room upstairs so you have more room for pre-K, especially, especially special ed pre-K downstairs. The time is now to build differently, to build better, and to build the schools of the future today. There's no planet B. Our students still only have one shot, and I urge you to spend wisely. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Elvita Lobo. Good evening, members of the board and Dr. McKnight. <clears throat> My name is Elvita Lobo. I have two daughters, uh, a kindergartner and a third grader, who attend Cold Spring Elementary School. Uh, I am here today with Noreen Kadir and um, Sumit Sharma, who testified earlier, to petition for funds to be allocated in an expedited fashion for the capital improvements projects at Cold Spring Elementary School. This request has been deprioritized more than, more than once in the CIP program. And I have two reasons that I want to share with you tonight uh, for this request. The first is the eventuality of an active shooter incident. I acknowledge it is uh, uncomfortable to talk about this, but I am concerned that our school does not have the safety guardrails in place if it were to occur. Our school has an open classroom concept from the 1970s. Because of these open flow plans, most of the school has to move through the building hallways to get to their lockdown locations. Some of these secured locations are simply storage closets where students would need to be crammed in. This is not a realistic safety plan for our children and staff. My second concern with this open flow plan is classroom focus. Uh, I was at my third grader's uh, open house a couple weeks ago. A single open space is divided into two spaces separated by a makeshift barrier. This serves as the two classrooms, two third grade classrooms. So while I was seated less than 15 feet from my uh, child's teacher, I still had trouble blocking out conversations happening in the adjacent space and needed to continually refocus my attention to what was happening in her class. This school has a lot going for it. It has a critical mass of experienced educators, a passionate principal, an active parent body that feeds from the vibrant community in the school is located in. And last but not the least, it hosts the County Center for Enriched Studies program. I strongly urge you to get independent experts to assess the school while it is in session on the two fronts we urgently need your help with safety and classroom focus. The open flow plan is not working for us. I thank you for this opportunity to, to be here today to share my testimony and for your time. Thank you. Our last testimony comes from and Andrea Gramonte and Julie Maldry. Please play the video. Hi, my name is Andrea Gramonte, and this is Julie Maudy. We work for School Health Services and we're assigned to Duthief Health Room. We just wanted to take a minute to show you our health room and some of the challenges that we have during the school day. Um, in Dufif, we have the highest percentage of special ed students in the whole county, and a lot of the students in our, or several students in our program do have medically fragile conditions. Our health room here at Dufif is very small. We can only accommodate one cot for students that need to be seen in one chair. Um, this creates challenges um, when we need to see multiple students at a time. We also do not have a separate office uh, for me to use as the nurse here. If I need to make confidential phone calls or attend medical meetings, I have to leave the health room to attend those meetings or make those phone calls. We also do not have a sink. Most health rooms in the county have a sink outside the bathroom. So this creates challenges when students come in and there's already another student in the bathroom. They have to wait. This prolongs the amount of time that they are missing instructions in the classroom. We don't have an extra privacy room. And so that creates a challenge because when we have students that have medical procedures that need to be done, we have them come into the health room. Then we have to lock the doors to the health room, put up a shade, and um, deal with those students in the health room itself instead of a private room. So during that time, if there is another student that needs to be seen in the health room, we quickly assess them out in the hallway, and then we send them to the main office where they have have to wait until we're until the health room is available again. 
This is our small bathroom here in the Defeef Health Room. Unfortunately, it is not handicap accessible. The sink, as you can see, is too high for students, so they must use the step stool. Um, a wheelchair would not be able to fit into this bathroom if our students come to school in a wheelchair. Um, it's also not able to accommodate. We have several students that need medical procedures to be performed in a bathroom throughout the school day, and we cannot use this space. This is a staff bathroom that we've been using to do medical procedures. Um, our room does not, it's not big enough to have this medical bed in those, in the health room or in the bathroom. So we do have to walk down the hall, bring students here and leave the health room unattended. And during that time, the front office staff has to manage the health room for us. Some of the medical procedures we perform daily here at to feed our diabetes care, wound care, ileostomy, and colostomy care, feeding tubes, and catheterizations. Having a larger health suite and handicap accessible bathroom comparable to what is in other MCPS elementary schools would allow us to safely and efficiently care for all the students. Thank you. At this time, I will take comments or questions from my fellow board members. Please turn on your light. Ms. Harris? Yeah, just a quick question about um, security vestibule at Dufif. Is that on our radar? I'm sure it is. Absolutely, and I, I see Mr. Barron in the audience, and, and we owe him an update in terms of where we are with that design, but it is a fully funded uh, security vestibule project for us that we uh, we are, it is our goal to implement as, as soon as possible with a target date of this summer installation. Um, and I guess the uh, issue that came up kind of repeatedly in talking about these open concept um, buildings is um, kind of the safety concerns. Have we gone into the open concept schools and in thought through some of those the issues that the parents are, are raising around safety if something really bad should happen yes and and uh cold spring um is <clears throat> on obviously the high priority of the major capital project because uh it is an open concept plan um it is uh the last truly open concept plan that we have the others have been uh basically you know carved up with a variety of different interior partitions um, unfortunately, Cold Spring is, was designed so that you cannot do that. Um, so a big step for us is obviously prioritizing that as a major capital project. But, but as we know, um, major capital projects are, are, are very difficult to fund just from one, one school perspective. We, we do look for a variety of different um, issues to solve with one project, but hence why we start to see capacity projects to solve overcrowding at, at adjacent clusters. So um, when we do see a, a school like Cold Spring that's um, built for 481 students and, and capacity of 354, um, and we see some of the other schools in the cluster with significant um, uh, enrollment or seat availability, we, we are going to look at that from a perspective of are there ways to solve other challenges in the school district uh, without just looking at it from an individual Cold Spring perspective. So. Again, it is a high priority. It's one that uh, we, we do, we will address from a feasibility study this year, um, but we, we will be going into it from a perspective of, of can, we, can we combine this with other major projects uh, to solve multiple issues with, with one single. Uh, DeFief is certainly another. DeFief, as, as you recall, was um, as enrollment declined at Rachel Carson. Uh, that was really the, 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 the large reasoning for prioritizing that project with with enrollment declines we did sort of we did back away and again that's why we're coming now to do the vestibule but we will look at this from a cluster-wide perspective as well as adjacent clusters to see how we can um, really accelerate these projects and solve multiple issues with with hopefully single funding type of solutions yeah, and I appreciate you mentioning that because I've been looking at the, the book and noticing that there's significant capacity available in this cluster, elementary schools. Um, and so I appreciate you mentioning possibly looking at other ways to get the children into safer facilities while we're waiting on the big project. But I guess my more immediate concern is, are we looking at the, you know, the we have what we have, 
and sort of consulting and maybe with an external consultant to see what sort of um, safety accommodations could be made within the structure that exists. Um, because I do hear very clearly these parents' concerns about, you know, if, if the worst should happen, um, that a particularly vulnerable layout. Um, and I, I mean, not an expert at all on that kind of thing, but there probably are people out there that are. So we, we will consult with, with our safety and security team, which I, I know they have, have reviewed this particular school. Um, certainly report back on any, any infrastructure improvements we can make in the short term that, that could enhance the safety and security of that school. Thank you. Dr. Dalka. Yeah, I just, um, I wanted to ask about the vestibule because I know that you have a list and you've just about given every school vest, you just uh, let them know when that might happen. And um, also, uh, I don't know whether you can do anything about this or not, but the health room um, at Dufif, and they have 32% special ed kids. That is a lot. My school had 25% and it was, and they were just, well, it was a lot. So um, I don't know whether you can help with that or not, but, but I understand what they're saying, how you have to take them out of the, the uh, health room and down the hall and privacy and they have to wait in the office. So it's unfortunate. Um, I'm going to go back to um, Nurse Johnson at Wheaton. Uh, they mentioned, or she mentioned, plumbing and losing power. Was it Wheaton High School she was talking about? because that's a little surprising since that's not a really old building. So um, maybe you could look into that. Absolutely. Ms. Silvestri. Um, yes, uh, thank you. So we heard um, great testimony today from many of you and um, uh, we also heard testimony saying, ask for what you need. Um, we know that funding is limited, but that's a priority of the, of the board and the superintendent to ask, to put forth what we really need. Um, however, as has been stated, oftentimes we are told, well, well, we only have so many dollars and therefore we have to make decisions about, um, it's called the non-recommended list. We're not really recommending them because we said we needed them. But we do have to have uh, put forth a list to the county council in terms of, all right, if you only have X millions of dollars, what do you prioritize? And so, uh, Mr. Adams, this is a hard question, but could you uh, just explain to us, like, what, what factors do you take into consideration in terms of prioritizing? Because if, if we're putting forth our, what we need, and then we're told, sorry, we don't have that much money, then we have to come back and say, well, um, we need this, however, uh, the, here, there's a priority list. And I think we've heard from the public tonight kind of that feeling of we keep getting not prioritized and other projects move forward. So just for their, our understanding, uh, could you shed light into what that process is like? And I know these are very difficult decisions that we make because we want to fund all of these projects. And, and that's a great question and, and one that um, unfortunately over time you, you typically do start to see delays in order to um, essentially move money out of the CIP. So uh, what I mean by that is the CIP is a six-year CIP. Um, we have the, the duration of projects that you know could be three, four years within the CIP. Um, when some of those questions come out, a lot of times they ask us, can you shift some of the expenditures, some of the money into the out year so it doesn't necessarily show up in the CIP? That's how you end up with some of the delays. Um, what I would say is this year that's going to be very unique is that um, you know, a lot of those delays end up with projects that have not yet started. They have not yet either started design or have not yet started construction. We're now in a phase where we are imminent to starting construction. We're at the tail end of our design. Um, so delays to projects like, like uh, the Woodward, um, Crown, Northwood, Damascus um, are going to be significantly more impactful. And, and quite honestly, I'm not sure we would be able to delay them without other trickle-down impacts. Um, so unfortunately, this year, if asked that question, um, it will be 
most likely one of the more difficult um, CIP uh, evaluations. Um, and hopefully it does not look at individual projects like our HVAC infrastructure and, and others, but um, if, if we are faced with, with significant um, revenue shortages at the county and we're asked to reduce, this, this will, you know, in all transparency, be a very, very difficult um, spring CIP season for us. Um, because a delay of one of those high schools um, is going to impact four, five, six, seven different schools, clusters, the entire consortium, and, and that's not um, something that we will be able to easily overcome, particularly since we are running out of room at many of these schools, as you heard um, at, from the WJ and some of our Down County Consortium schools. So um, hopefully we're not asked to do that this year, uh, but if we are, it's, it is going to be something that we'll, we'll look at from from expenditures, uh, what are the least impactful delays, um, and then even are we even able to move that kind of money out of the CIP to be able to, to meet the, the expectations of, of whatever budget we're, we're confronted with. Thank you. Mr. Kim. Uh, what about net zero schools? How, how have we explored that, if at all? Oh, absolutely, that's, that's one of our um, top priorities as part of our sustainability policy. Uh, what I would say, though, is one nuanced difference with with us that we've we've found is that it's it's very difficult to manage the infrastructure that we currently have. Uh, so what we typically try to employ is to partner with um, energy providers that that will do solar panel installations that will own the solar panels and that we are able to. Uh, generate electricity, but not necessarily be responsible for the maintenance and upkeep of those panels. So, uh, schools like Crown, ev actually every one of our schools are are going into it from a from a solar net zero ready perspective. And and as we get closer, further in construction, we will start to put out RFPs to partner with with a variety of different um, energy providers to meet those goals. Okay, I'm not seeing any other lights, so I think this we have reached the end of tonight's testimony hearing. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate your coming and sharing your concerns with us.